Our scripture today is drawn from 1 Samuel chapter 15. This chapter is 35 verses in length, and I'm going to read selected verses. Beginning at verse 1, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camel and donkeys. Saul set out to do that exact thing. Verse 7 says he attacked the Amalekites. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I have made Saul king. There then ensues a meeting between Samuel and Saul in which Saul asserts by, that he didn't do anything wrong and tries to track out of the problem by lying. But the, in a classic response, Samuel says, what is this lowing of cattle and bleeding of sheep that I hear? That activity denied the denial that Saul was making. And then Samuel, in one of the really great verses of all the Old Testament for memorability, says to Saul in verse 22, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Samuel announces that the kingdom is taken from Saul, Saul pleads Samuel to remain and grabs at his robe, but it tears. And Samuel says, so will your kingdom be torn from you. Yet to save Saul's face, Samuel offers up sacrifice and stays with him and then departs from him, never to go to him again. This chapter raises some very heavy issues. Issues like just war, holy war, the slaughter of innocents, capital punishment. And I am not within the compass of our time going to ignore those issues. I will deal with them, not in the detail that I would like. But while dealing with them, I want to come to what for us is the bottom line of the scripture because we must always tag scripture into our practical need. And thus the focus of my message deals with the theme, living with a good conscience. Saul is a person who is in violation of his conscience. And we see the steps God took to arouse his conscience and bring him to repentance. Our lives can be compared to a cargo ship at sea. Properly loaded, the ship cruises at its water line, loaded too heavily, and the ship sinks beneath the water line. Guilt in our human experience overloads us. Whether that guilt is real guilt or false guilt. False guilt is when we convince ourselves of a bunch of I shoulds. I should do this. I should preach better. I should be on time. I should keep my desk clean. I should keep my bed made. All those kinds of I shoulds, which aren't necessarily rooted in any real objective criteria or standard in God's word. Whether it's real guilt or false guilt, it can very much sink our lives personally, emotionally, existentially. In the scripture, guilt is established by an objective standard rather than a subjective standard of feeling. Thus, a person may say, well, I don't feel guilty at all, and yet be guilty as all get out because they violated God's law whether they felt it or not. On the other hand, a person may say, I feel so guilty, and yet that person may not be guilty at all because what they feel guilty over is not condemned in scripture. Defining guilt and defining conscience is the most difficult thing. We all have a conscience, but it seems our consciences do differ from one another. 
conscience is meant to approve or to reprove our behavior, but the maturing Christian comes to know that the conscience is to be shaped by the objective standards within God's Word. I grew up not understanding the difference between subjective and objective standards of guilt and conscience, so there were some things that I thought were wrong that weren't wrong. I'll give you a little illustration of how tender my youthful conscience was. In my growing up years in the church, my conscience did not bother me, and there was no guilt. If I struck a wooden ball on a green lawn with a wooden mallet, directing it through a wicket or hoop, my conscience did not bother me. If I took a stick in my hand, called a bat, and hit a ball that was covered with cowhide, nor did my conscience bother me if I threw an elliptical ball inflated through the air, nor did it bother me if I threw a syndrilical ball through the air through a hoop and scored a basket. However, my conscience bothered me if I took a small wooden ball, placed it on a green felt table, and struck it with a wooden stick called a cue stick, directing it toward a pocket. And my conscience also bothered me if I took a wooden ball, large, with three holes in it and rolled it down a wooden alley into a set of ten pins. My conscience told me it was wrong to play pool and it was wrong to bowl. That conscience was shaped by tradition rather than by the written standard of Scripture. And so maturing was finding the objective standard of Scripture rather than tradition. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's always okay to throw out tradition. Sometimes there are traditions with good reasons. We need guilt and conscience to be shaped by God's Word. And as we approach today's scripture, we see five areas where the conscience is dealt with. There is first the testing of the conscience, verses 1 through 9. Then secondly, there is the probing or the awakening of the conscience, I should say. The awakening of the conscience, verses 10 through 16. Then there is the probing of the conscience, verses 17 through 23. The cleansing of the conscience verse 24 through 31, and the fifth, the sad fallout of a violated conscience, verses 32 through 35. If you didn't get all those down, we'll look at them one at a time. First, the test of conscience. Saul is given an objective standard to adhere to. He is told in verses 1 through 3 to go out and destroy the Amalekites, every last one of them, and every last thing that they had. That's a troublesome text for us living in these times. It's troublesome from the vantage point of the cross. And we might well ask, did not the Lord tell us to forgive rather than to destroy our enemies? Therefore, what's a text like this doing in Scripture? That's a natural response we have when we first begin to read it. However, if we think for just a moment, we realize that even within the New Testament teaching of the cross of Christ, God through that cross does not do away with his judgments. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that someday we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and answer for what we've done with the cross, the deeds we've done in the flesh. And verse 11 of that chapter of 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. In other words, there is an aspect of God that motivates us to fear because of the prospect of an awesome judgment. One day, indeed, the Lord is going to judge the world. And texts like the one we have before us today illustrate that God is deadly serious about his judgments. Saul was going to be tested on a very objective standard. He had a clear word from the Lord. We must note that his clear word from the Lord is not a similar word that is spoken to all of us. We'll never be told to do what Saul was told to do because we're not the head of state. We're not a president or a prime minister or a king or a queen. We're an individual citizen. Saul was being told to take action as a head of state. He was told to lead a just war, or if you will, a holy war. We ask from our modern perspective, what kind of a God would give orders for a holy war? And what difference is there between 1 Samuel 1 through 3 and the kind of activity we see today with the Ayatollah Khomeini. Does not verses 1 and 3 of 1 Samuel 15 belong in a pre-Christian age, we might ask, or belong in an age where people go off on religious wars that do so much destruction? Well, here is, I think, the response 
when the existence of an innocent people is at stake. God sanctions the activity of government to protect those people. That's both an Old Testament and a New Testament principle. The governor, Paul says in Romans 13, does not bear the sword in vain. In other words, God has given to government, which he has divinely established, the responsibility to punish the wrongdoer, whether that wrongdoer be an internal domestic enemy and therefore a police force, magistrates and judges are required, or whether that enemy be an external enemy, such as a foreign foe or alien. The scripture in the New Testament as well as the Old gives to government the power to protect its people and to promote justice. If therefore you see Agag in 1 Samuel 15, as though we were talking about Hitler or Mussolini, we will get the picture of that chapter in its proper perspective, for that's the exact kind of a person we're dealing with. Agag led his people on a savage and ruthless attack against Israel. That enmity between the nations began years before the present Agag, and Agag is really not a proper name, it's a title, much like Pharaoh. In the decades earlier, when Israel had fresh come out of the bondage of Egypt, they were walking defenseless to the Sinai. And there they were encountered by a group of people called the Amalekites. Amalek was the grandson of Esau, who was the brother of Jacob. Therefore, the Amalekites are distant cousins to the people of Israel. And Amalek in the wilderness did a very treacherous thing to Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 17 and 18 tell us about what they did. It says, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came up out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out. They met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. Who is it that lags behind? It's not the strong men, it's not the army, it's not the people of strength. The people that lag behind are the people on crutches and wheelchairs. They're the old folk, they're the sick, they're the pregnant, the nursing mothers and the small children. The Amalekites, rather than meeting Israel coming out of the wilderness in war, head on confronting their army, chose to attack them cowardly from the rear and do violence to their innocents. And the Amalekites had a track record over the intervening years of doing that same thing against Israel. So long as one Amalekite remained, there was no safety for any Israeli living in southern Israel. We may want to look at that and say, but I thought Jesus taught pacifism. If you look carefully at the subject of pacifism, I think in the New Testament, you could be persuaded to come to the conclusion that what Jesus forbade us to do, he forbade us to take personal retaliation, one-to-one -one retaliation. But he did not at all take away prerogative from a government to protect its people from internal and external danger, that power to bear the sword is given to the state, Romans 13. It is reprehensible for any individual, including a Saul, within Old Testament times, to take an individual action to destroy someone else, to just go off on a hunt for another human being. But Saul was not acting as an individual. He is acting as a head of state. He is doing the same thing Franklin Delano Roosevelt had to do in December of 1941 we're acting on behalf of all the American people he declared war that we might, as innocent people, be protected from a grave danger. It was a hard choice. Calling war is always a hard choice. It's never to be entered into lightly. The destruction of the innocent, which is also commanded of Saul, is seen in similar fashion in contemporary history in the, in the decision that Harry Truman made he held the responsibility when he was president of choosing whether the killing of the innocent at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was necessary in order to stop an even greater carnage and destruction. At Hiroshima and at Nagasaki, men, women, infants, and children, along with cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys, to use our text, were all destroyed. It was awful. We pray that it will never happen again but it is a well-established principle within war that the innocent suffer. Witness Japan, witness the suffering of Japanese people here in America, witness the innocent in Germany who had to pay the Allies reparations after World War II 
when most of them were not responsible for the gulags and the concentration camps. So the innocent of Amalek suffered because the threat of them as a people to Israel was such that the actions of their armies and king brought God's people into danger. In America, we have had the phrase, remember the Alamo, and that phrase has been a stirring call to patriotism and duty. In ancient Israel, the phrase was not, remember the Alamo, it was, remember the Amalekites. Unless Israel could secure its borders and protect its people, there would be no nation from which would come kings, priests, prophets, and ultimately the Messiah. The test for Saul, therefore, as the head of state, was whether or not he would obey this clear word of God which set him out to not bear the sword in vain. If we want to spiritualize this text for just a moment, we can also do that. For on the spiritual level, the Amalekites represent the flesh, that side of our human nature that is in rebellion against God and which takes rearguard action against our spiritual self. The destruction of the Amalekites ordered by God is a lesson to us that we cannot even let one little bit of the flesh live if we are to dwell in spiritual safety. We must crucify the flesh with its desires. We must put to death the old nature. An old priest was asked by a young man, Father, when will I cease to be bothered by the sins of the flesh? To which the priest, the old man, wisely replied, I won't trust myself, my son, until I have been dead for three days. <clears throat> that pretty much describes the ongoing struggle with the flesh. I used to think that when I was young that there came a day when you grew out of being tested. Friends, I can at least tell you that you're going to be tested through the year 46. I don't know if those of you that are ahead of me into the 60s if you're still being tested or not, but uh, I suspect you are. In 1882, the great Anglican Cardinal Newman preached a message at the University of Oxford called Willfulness, the Sin of Saul, in which in elegant language he puts before us these words, the spirit of Saul still lives. The principle of cleaving and breaking down all divine ordinances instead of building up. And with Saul's sin, Saul's portion awaits his followers. Distraction, aberration, the hiding of God's countenance, imbecility, rashness, and changeableness in their counsels, judicial blindness, fear of the multitude, alienation from good men and faithful friends, subserviency to their worst foes, the kings of, Al of Amalek and the witches of Endor, such is the ever-righteous doom of those who trust their own wills more than God's. Saul's test was simply this. Will you obey God's clear word to you? That is a question put before us. The nature of our test may be different, but the question is the same. Will you obey God's clear word in your life? Saul did not. And you might say, if I were Saul, even if I were head of state, I wouldn't have obeyed either. I'd have said to God, God, I'll fight the war, but I will limit my action militarily against those who are in military uniform. I will spare the civilian population to the best of my ability. I will extract judgment only on the most guilty. I will not blindly follow orders that I believe to be a violation of the moral order. I will not kill babies. Note, however, what Saul does. He doesn't make a statement like that. Instead, he kills the most innocent and spares the most guilty. Verse 9 tells us, everything that was despised and weak, they destroyed. The people on crutches, the people in wheelchairs, the babies, the young, the weak, the sickly, they destroyed those. But the strong and the fat and the king he protected. That is the moral equivalent to the idea that after World War II, the Allied forces would have been justified in annihilating all of Germany but sparing Hitler. It's the same principle. Saul shows a corruption in character in that his concern is not the preservation of the innocent, but the preservation of the guilty. After World War II, the Nuremberg trials established the principle that, no, that a person is responsible for his own actions and that no officer shall be allowed to plead a defense of blind obedience to an order 
when that order is morally invalid. Had Saul saved the women, children, and infants, he would have still been disobedient. But I have a feeling that had he based his actions on moral grounds, God might have let him take the position of an intercessor. For we learn from Abraham's dealings with God over the destruction of Sodom that God is willing to bargain over the terms of an assignment and even reduce his demands. But Saul acts with no, absolutely no, noble moral intention. His actions are immoral and heinous. He destroys the civilian population and saves the worst perpetrator of all. He was tested. Would he be obedient? And he failed the test. Could I ask you, in what areas are, is your obedience to God being tested? All of us, I'm sure, can identify those. This leads us past the testing of conscience to the awakening of conscience, verses 10 through 16. What we do is known to God. There is nothing about us that is hidden from him. And Saul's actions were known to God, and God then makes them known to Samuel. Now, not always does God make our private actions and thoughts known to someone else. In Saul's case, he did, but sometimes with us, he doesn't. As the New Testament says, some men's sins precede them to judgment and others follow after. It's just a simple way of saying is sometimes what you do that's wrong is found out now, and sometimes it isn't found out till you stand before God. Saul not only had disobeyed the Lord, he also constructed a monument to his victory, thereby taking credit for the win and falling prey to pride. Maybe you can see it in the text as you have looked with me closely at 1 Samuel, but Saul had a deep need for approval. He grew up under the shadow of a super dominant father. He was struck with a deep inferiority complex and people who have lived in under the dominance of someone else generally have inferiority complexes and desperately want approval. And Saul wants approval. He shows that need for approval and wanting to create a monument so people will think he's somebody. And then he doesn't have the guts to tell the people to stop saving all the fat animals. He curries their favor and he also wants the approval that will accrue to him when he can show off his captive king his rival that he can lead around like a dog on a chain and show that as his uh, trophy of war. We make a lot of bad choices in life because we are desperate for approval. And so we launch out into a decision that we think will gain us the approval we seek, only to find out that if that decision is in violations of God's will, there will be problems. And yet in it all, the text of Scripture so wonderfully states that God loves Saul. I see his love for Saul in the phrase, I am grieved, verse 10, I am grieved. The very fact that God has emotional feelings toward this man, Saul, shows that he loves him. You only grieve for someone you care about. If you don't care about them, you just shrug your shoulders and walk away and say, I don't give a rip what happens to them. But God cared for this man as he cares for you and me. So Samuel is sent to awaken the consciousness of Saul. Even as when we have violated God's tests, he finds ways of wanting to awaken us. It's interesting to watch Saul's response. It's a typical pattern of denial of wrong. First of all, he's spiritually glib. Samuel comes to him and he says, the Lord bless you. It's the ex greeting you would expect him to have given at church among charismatic friends a good holy hug, and all's well, and you can never tell by the veneer and the gloss that anything is wrong. It's religious language. We use it, and it comes in good stead. And then Saul follows that spiritual glibness with big, I call it big lie number one. He tells four lies in the course of his conscience being awakened. Big lie number one is, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. End of sentence, no qualification. I've done it. Samuel responds with a classic because he hears the animals lowing and bleating that Saul has saved. What is this lowing of cattle and bleating of sheep if you've carried out these instructions? So Samuel backtre or Saul backtreads a little bit and tells big lie number two, verse 15. Well, we save them to sacrifice them to the Lord. 
instant lie made up on the spot. We cover our tracks and we try to justify ourselves. His conscience is getting awakened, but that's not the end of it. For the third thing is going to happen in regard to his conscience. It's been tested. It's now being awakened. And thirdly, it will be probed. And Samuel's going to get in there. Like if you've ever been in for an examination after an incision of some kind and the doctor puts an instrument in that open wound. <sighs> and uh, you can tell that that's happened to me. I'm even holding where it happened. And that's what Samuel is about to do to Saul's conscience. He's going to put the steel utensil of God's eternal unchanging word into the wound of his life and do some probing and it's going to hurt. Verses 17 through 23. Samuel charges Saul with three things. One, ingratitude toward God. Verse 17, God made you king and yet you were ungrateful. Someone has said, the good ones God uses and the bad ones use God. Saul was one of the bad ones. God couldn't use him. He was going to use God. Samuel also charges him with disobedience, verse 18, and with irresponsibility, verse 19. Saul responds with big lie number three, but I did obey the Lord, followed by his only admission, I spared Agag, the Hitler, the criminal, followed by big lie number four in verse 21. We say these things to sacrifice them. When we have done wrong, it's a natural tendency to cover our tracks. That's human. Saul is maybe thinking, if he were a college student, I think he would think something like this. God, I think I passed that test. So I got more than 70% right. You told me to do about five things and I did three and a half of them. That's got to be passing, Lord. It's like the Frank and Ernest cartoon where they're talking to one another and one says to the other, I don't want to be a saint or anything. Can I just live life, pass, fail? Samuel is saying back to Saul, with God, passing is 100%. In fact, verses 22 and 23 are among the most powerful words of obedience in all the Bible. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. What Samuel is saying here is that worship must not be divorced from personal and social responsibility. And you can offer all the sacrifices you want or sing all the charismatic courses you want or make all the financial contributions you want or attend all the meetings you will. And yet, if in our personal and social life and our social responsibility to the needy, we live in violation of God's word, the worship is meaningless. That's a hard word because we live in a feel-good age. And we much would rather feel good than be called to duty. That's why it's so difficult for pastors in today's culture to even venture into subjects like this because we have a responsibility with you coming out of the high-pressure week you've come out of to send you on your way with a whistle and to give you some encouragement. And here I am talking about something that's kind of heavy. I called my son, George Paul, who's a freshman going on 40, years of age at Wheaton College. And he's just tearing that place up, getting straight A's and taking these. He wrote a paper on amniocentosis or something like this. I, it's beyond me. I read the paper and I said, it's great, but I don't understand it. <laughs> and uh, I, I, in talking with him this week on the phone, I said, George, I'm working on 1 Samuel 15. I'm dealing with just war, capital punishment, infanticide, slaughter of the innocents. I said, you've got any perspectives from your study to help me on this sermon? So he spits off several things. And then, he, and then I reminded him, or he reminded me of this phrase, to obey is better than to sacrifice. He said, Dad, I'm taking this course right now in minor prophets. And he said, boy, am I ever seeing it. He said, the minor prophets over and over again were saying you cannot divorce worship from personal and social responsibility. He said, if, you're, if we're just getting together to, in a church service to sing songs and feel good, he said, and we're not doing anything about the needs in the world or not, our own personal lives are not in rectitude, he said, then something's, something's wrong. Our worship is worthless thought he's, he's discovering what the prophets were all about. And um, they probed, the prophets probed the conscience. That's what Samuel does with Saul. 
Well, fortunately, we can get to a cleansed conscience. Verses 24 through 31. Finally, Saul owns up the responsibility. Three great words. I have sinned. Boy, are those words hard to say. <sighs> but Lord, it's somebody else's fault. I went into it unwillingly. It was all their fault. I was dropped on my head when I was a kid. <laughs> it's not fair. Oh, it's so hard to say those words. I have sinned. With Saul, there's still a bit of escapism. I was, he blames, he's still blaming. I was afraid of the people. I had a reason for sinning. But at least he admits it. And that's when you can begin to get to cleansing. Saul's admission is followed by censure. Saul, Samuel says to him, look, you're going to be rejected as king over Israel. I love the way God rejects people, by the way. Uh, when I reject, if I reject somebody, if someone's in, in employment and, and they're rejected from office, man, hey, it's all over. You know, you take leave in a day or 30 days or two weeks pay or whatever. Mayor Tom Bradley recently had to f fire or says he had to fire this lady that was in charge of some big de department in the city of Los Angeles. And it's been a big brouhaha in the news over that. And boy, she's, when she's let go, she's let go. She doesn't have that office anymore. You know how long Saul stays in office after God rejects him as king? The whole rest of his life. Decades go by. And we get a, get a feeling for what it meant to be rejected as king in view of the fact that that rejection really pertains to his dynasty and to his successors. And even though God rejected him from office, his grace allowed him to remain in the office. And not only that, God never rejected the man on a personal level. So Saul bears a responsibility and pays a price for his disobedience, but that price did not include estrangement from God. Benjamin Franklin said it well, he that cannot obey cannot command. Saul's kingdom is to be torn from him. The last part of the text takes us to the sad fallout in a violated conscience, verses 32 through 35. We may get forgiveness and cleansing from God, and yet there are always social consequences to our sin. God's forgiveness does not wipe out those consequences that occur in our lives. When we look at those consequences for Saul, we simply ought to note for a moment that Samuel finishes the job that Saul was called out to do. He brings Agag before him, this Pharaoh of the Amalekites, and the King James puts it rather elegantly and graphically. He hewed him in pieces before the Lord. <laughs> Violent text, Samuel Rambo. <laughs> but was he really? Was he not carrying out a judicial execution? He was not acting out of personal vengeance. It was not a matter of personal murder. He was acting on behalf of the government, the state, and he was executing a criminal who had made women childless, whose crimes had been vicious, and who merited the punishment of death. It was an execution. Have you noticed how these scriptures, uh, this chapter has touched on three tremendous issues today? Does a nation have a right to defend itself militarily or to have a police force internally? Is it ever justified in going to war? And can it exercise the responsibility of capital punishment? The Old Testament verdict is clear, yes on all counts. And I think when Romans 13 is viewed in light of the sword being given to the government, that is clear also in the New Testament, although I respect the fact that not all Christians agree together on this point. Saul, however, has some personal consequences. I want to close on that level because it's my goal never to be theoretical. There are consequences of the violation of his consequence, of his, of his conscience. Sad fallout to him, even though he seeks God's forgiveness and repents. He has to live with consequence number one. There is a ruptured relationship between him and the significant others of his life. Samuel will not go to Saul again. 
Now later, 1 Samuel 19, we'll find that Saul one time goes to Samuel, but Samuel does not go again to him. Their relationship has been severely impacted and affected. The second sad consequence is that there was ruined opportunity for Saul to be all that God would have him to be. Decades before Saul, the strange prophet Balaam had prophesied of Israel, their king will be greater than Agag, their kingdom will be exalted. Saul was meant to be greater than an Agag, but he wasn't. And therefore Samuel mourned and the Lord grieved. It was a ruined opportunity. He messed up his life. Someone has said, what you are is God's gift to you, and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. And the third sad consequence is the real unforeseen circumstance that happens to Saul as a result of his sparing of the Amalekites. Ruptured relationship, ruined opportunity, real unforeseen circumstance, because what we sow in life, we reap, and it has a boomerang effect on us. You can jump with me all the way through chapters of Scripture down to 2 Samuel chapter 1, and you will find that chapter describing the last moments of Saul's life. He is on a military expedition, once more as a head of state. He is against the Philistines. He's to the north on Mount Gilboa, and the battle goes against him, and in desperation, he leans in an act of suicide upon his sword. But he is a careless self-executioner, and the wound is not mortal. And he is writhing in agony, and a man passing by sees him, and Saul calls out to him, finish the job. And the man reaches out and thrusts through Saul and kills him. And that same man then, knowing that David will be king, rushes to bring him what he thinks will be good news. Saul is dead. David looks at him when he hears the word and says, Man, who are you? And he said, I am an Amalekite. What Saul failed to kill, killed him. And that's the point of the text, that what we do not deal with that is wrong in our life will be our undoing unless we deal with it. How different is the story of the New Testament Saul, Paul of Tarsus, who is able at the conclusion of his life to look straight to the Sanhedrin and says, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience unto this day, and who days later can say to a Roman government, governor, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man, and who urges his young son Timothy in the faith to fight the good fight of faith, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have re rejected these, and so have shipwrecked their faith, living with a good conscience. Obey God's clear word to you. Readily and voluntarily confess sin when you have violated conscience. And walk in God's truth and in his love. Hebrews 13, 18. We are sure we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. Our Lord, we pray those words for ourselves today. For we also desire to live honorably in every way and to live with a clear conscience. Forgive us, Lord, when we have failed you and failed others. Help us, Lord, to keep the clear look in our eyes, whereby we can face you or any person and be covered by the blood of Christ and be washed with his innocence and his peace. We realize, Lord, that we do not have the capacity to forgive ourselves nor justify ourselves. When we have done wrong, the stains remain. It is only you who can separate our sins from us. It is only you who can justify and make righteous. We lean, therefore, Lord, the entire weight of our person upon you, pleading for your forgiveness and your help. Wash us, and we shall be clean. Purge us, and we shall be white as snow. For those who come to this service looking at areas in their own life where they have faced tests related to conscience and real guilt, we ask, Lord, that the ministry of your Holy Spirit would be such today as to cause us to come again to the foot of the cross and admit our need and confess our wrong and be healed and restored by you.
We pray, too, that you will give us strength for every test, that we might be found in you, not being ashamed. We ask these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.